experiential. Um, when I think about what did I learn the most from conducting the action study was that it, um, whatever therapeutic concepts or strategies we taught the kids, we had to do it experientially. They had to experience what we were talking about in order for them to be willing to try it. And I think that's where people typically miss the boat with CBT. So they think, oh, you know, I'm going to um, teach you how to think more positively, and I'm going to do it in one session. And so what you've got to do is you've got to catch those negative thoughts and turn them around to be positive. And now I've done my one session of cognitive restructuring. You should be able to do it and um, understand why you're doing it. Literally, if you look at the treatment manuals that are out there, that's what's done in a lot of the treatments is one session of training for each of the skills. Kids don't get it. They're not going to be able to do it. It takes a long time for the kids to learn the skills. And for them to learn it, they have to experience it in session and then apply it outside of the session. So that's, I think, one of the things that's a really important takeaway from the study and from today is how you got to make it experiential. Um, so we want them to do the things in session. We want them to experience the benefits of doing it in session. So think about you all who do the um, anxiety work. If you were to do an expo, if you were to explain how you do exposures, and then you sent the kids out to do them, are they going to do it? They're not going to do it. They have to experience it in session and see that their anxiety goes up, but it really does have a limiting um, kind of life to it, and it comes down and goes away. And the more that I do it, the shorter the time is that it goes up and it doesn't go up as far. So if I do it, and I do it a lot, it goes away. Oh my gosh. And then if I attack another one, it's not as bad. And if I do another one after that, it's even not as bad as that one. So um, that experiencing it in the session builds credibility. It builds um, the um, kids' motivation for doing it outside of session. For kids that are depressed, what do they say? They say, nothing makes me feel good. It doesn't matter what I do, I don't feel good. Well, one of the things that um, we did um, that I used to get kind of kitted by some of my colleagues about was they go, oh, there goes Kevin with the hula hoops again. And um, <laughs> you're the hula hoop therapist. So um, what we ended up doing was uh, we bought a bunch of hula hoops, and um, most of the kids had never seen one before. And um, when we were teaching them about um, how doing fun things elevates mood, we had them hula hoop. And um, kids would start with a mood rating of like anywhere from zero to two, sometimes as high as a three on a zero to 10 scale with 10 being phenomenal, zero being as low as you can go. And five minutes of hula hooping, their moods would be up to six and seven. They'd hear on the tapes the kids talking in this kind of low affect, very slow, kind of quiet voice. A couple minutes into hula hooping, you'd hear them giggling, talking louder. They'd come back after the five minutes of hula hooping. They'd be excited. Um, they'd re-rate their moods. They'd be up to six or seven and um, led to a conclusion. And the conclusion was, I can raise my mood. So um, experiencing that in session was really important. And we taught each of the coping skills that way in session, and they experienced it. It makes it more understandable and concrete, uh, makes it more memorable. Engaging, again, you've got to make therapy fun. Um, you've got to help them to feel good, elevate their mood, and it's more um, memorable as well. OK, um, the orientation of the um, treatment program is problem solving, coping, cognitive therapy. Um, it's behavioral. Depressive symptoms represent problems to be solved. So um, as the therapist, 
that's your mindset. Whatever symptoms they come in with, we can solve it. They're nothing more than problems to be solved. We work together, we'll be able to solve that problem. Um, this experience of stress is a problem to be solved. Um, if, what do you do if you can't eliminate stress? You cope with it. A lot of these kids are in um, very unfortunate situations. They can't change the situation. Um, one of the um, interviews in the qualitative dissertation after um, treatment was over, the um, interviewer asked one of the girls, you know, um, how come you didn't get better? And um, she said, well, the treatment just, it didn't work. And so the interviewer probed further and said, well, what didn't work? Well, you, um, I learned to do problem solving. And so what was the problem that you applied it to? Well, my parents um, were getting divorced. So I tried problem solving. My goal was to stop the divorce, but it didn't work. So I gave up. Well, unfortunately, the therapist didn't catch it. So the girl didn't verbalize it while she was getting treated because what would we have really wanted to do with that? We really would have wanted to teach her coping strategies. It's a situation that's outside of her control. She can't make it better, but she can help herself feel better about it. So that's really where we would have wanted to go. And unfortunately, she didn't verbalize it. The therapist didn't catch it. And so the kid didn't end up improving. Um, we want to reactivate the kids, get them behaviorally activated. Um, we want to change their negative, unhealthy thinking. In order to really produce long-term change, we want to change core beliefs. So for you all who said you wanted to learn more about the cognitive restructuring, that's going to be our goal. And we'll be talking about that a lot tomorrow. Um, we also want to change the things that are going on in their environment. We want to get the parents to cue and reinforce the kids for using their skills. Um, we want to switch, just like for those of you who are in the, um, working with externalizing disorders, you teach the parents to use positive um, behavior management procedures, so we do a lot of that. Um, one of the components that's not in this intervention, but I use a lot with the depressed kids that I work with, is um, the whole kind of um, positive time with the kids, you know, where you try to get the parents to spend 10 to 15 minutes of time. Well, even 20 minutes would be really nice, but, you know, if you can get them to spend some time one-on-one -on -one with the kids just enjoying um, something together, that's a really powerful um, intervention. Um, improved parent-child communication, where we're going to be talking about communication training improve family problem solving. So we want to get away from the very conflictual environment that they're typically in, reduce conflict, reduce um, use of punishment, and um, we want to create a home environment that corrects their negative way of thinking. That's not always easy to do. That can be pretty hard. Okay, the art of treatment, as I mentioned, it's got to be fun, engaging, memorable, in the moment. So we take whatever the kids bring that day and we apply the skills that they're learning to what they bring in that day. Another really important part is, remember, the kids have to apply the skills. It's one thing to learn them, but it's a whole other thing to actually apply it. And so application is really critical. And we're going to try to set up um, learning experiences that help change their core beliefs. Um, the intervention was a group intervention, and yet the therapists used individual case conceptualizations so that while they were teaching the skills, while they were talking about the therapeutic issues of the day, they always kept in mind how to make it work for each of the kids in the group. So. Um, that takes a while to get good at, but it's kind of like um, the research on who are the best teachers. The best teachers are the ones who 
are kind of with it. They know what's going on with each of the kids, and they um, adapt what they're teaching to each of those kids. Uh, one time, I was asked, I was invited to be um, guest coach for the um, UT Lady Longhorn basketball team. And the first time they asked me to do it, I said no. Because I thought, oh my god, I don't know anything about basketball. You know, I shot baskets as a kid. I played a little intramural basketball. I could never coach. Well, that was a stupid thought. I don't have to coach. All you have to do is you come and you get to um, be on the sideline with the coaches and the players and you get to watch what they do. So once that was explained, I was like, yeah, I'd do it. That's great. So I got to um, opportunity to watch Jody Conrad, who's one of the winningest coaches in um, women's basketball. And um, when she would call a timeout, the players would come to her. You could watch her as she changed mid-sentence to an entirely different approach with a different player. And then to a different um, approach with a different player. And she did it smoothly, seamlessly. And so she knew what each player, what would help each of her players, and she could change in that group meeting what she did. So that's what a, a really good group therapist does. They can adjust to each of the um, individual people in the group. Yeah. One thing I just wanted to add to that, uh -huh. which I think working in a non-clinical environment like a school is so critical, is confidentiality. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, because without that, there's no safety. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we had the kids um, sign a confidentiality contract. And then we did this um, activity that we'll talk about later today called the web activity that showed them how they were connected to each other and how important confidentiality was. Um, we had um, one participant who broke confidentiality and the other group members learned about it. And so um, they processed it the next week. Um, decided on what they thought was an appropriate kind of consequence for breaking confidentiality. And um, that person, same person, broke confidentiality again. And so we uh, um, removed her from the group because it, it created an unsafe environment. And so no one was going to get better. Uh, yeah, so confidentiality is really critical in um, groups, especially in the schools where they're worried about Who's going to tell whom what? Yeah, because some deeply personal things come from out. Yeah. I mean, that's what we want to have come out, right. so it's got to, they have to feel safe to do it. And then we want the group relationships to be really um, supportive. Okay, so when you think about this intervention, um, there are three kind of things to keep in mind that um, simplify the whole thing, okay? So three kind of basic treatment <coughs> strategies. If something's bothering you that you might be able to change, use problem solving. If something's bothering you that you can't change, use your coping skills. If you're feeling bad and you know that it's because you're thinking negatively, change your thinking. So, in a nutshell, that's kind of the treatment. It's those three primary um, strategies that you want to teach the kids. Um, so, you know, we keep coming back to this over and over in the treatment so that the kids can um, have a real simple scheme of um, what's involved in helping them to get over their depression. Okay, the treatment program, um, it could be individual or group format, either works. When I was designing the study, um, I went back and forth in my mind about which I was going to do. Am I going to use a group intervention or individual? There's advantages to both. Then I thought, oh, I'll do a hybrid. We'll do a group with some individual, but that got to be too complex, so we did it as a group intervention, but it works equally well with individuals. Um, you just have to change the activities that are um, part of the therapy manual. 
Okay, here's something, there's 20 sessions, so that's a lot of sessions. Our attendance was actually great because we did it in the schools. And so, um, would you rather be in class or would you rather be having fun with a group of other kids? They chose having fun with other kids the most, most of the time. So we had really um, very good attendance. What's the national average for um, number of sessions attended in outpatient therapy? Six to eight. It's actually lower. It's three. So if you look at the um, healthcare data, some of the healthcare data, it's an average of three sessions. So you get six to eight. That's not bad. Um, what's the minimal number of sessions that you're, that's considered a minimal dose of psychotherapy? Eight. Okay? So most kids never even get a minimal dose. Um, and how many times have you had parents come into your clinic and, and say, especially the dads, they say, oh, I don't believe in that psychology stuff. It doesn't work. And a lot of times it doesn't because the people are only coming for three meetings. What are you going to get out of it? You're not going to get anything out of it. Even if you come for eight, you're just going to get a little bit out of it. Okay, so we had 20 sessions, um, which is a lot of sessions. And I know as an outpatient therapist, it's hard to get people in for 20 meetings. But it um, can be doable depending upon your client population. Pardon me? Incentivize. Yeah, incentivize it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but here's the next thing two times a week. So um, insurance plans won't cover it. They'll cover once a week. But I think what's happened is our model of child therapy is based on an adult model it's not developmentally appropriate. I think that um, if you look at, you all who do the anxiety research know that if you do mass practice, it's way more effective than if it's spread out over a number of sessions. And um, it's the same with treatment of depression. If you have the kids meeting more often, they get better faster. And um, if you think about a 10-year-old and um, they sit with you for an hour and then they leave and then a week later you ask them, so what do you remember about last week's meeting? I don't know, nothing, you know? So um, we, when we piloted the intervention, we, um, Beck, rec um, he recommends that you start with two times meeting twice a week and then you go to once a week and then you fade at later on. So we tried that out. We started twice a week. Kids were doing their therapeutic homework. They were getting things. Then we went to once a week, stopped doing their homework, and they didn't remember what was going on from session to session. So they taught us really quickly that it's much better to do um, sessions twice a week. And maybe that's one of the differences between us and Tad's is Tad's was 12 weeks, one session a week. Ours is 11 weeks, but two sessions a week. So I think that helps a lot. Um, 50 to 70 minutes, depending upon age. Uh, a little longer for the older kids. You could flip it. You could say a little longer for the younger kids because it takes them longer to really catch the concepts. You know, so it depends on their, your ability to keep them engaged. You have to adjust the content and the activities for the age and format, whether it's individual or group. Um, if group, it's same gender grouping. So um, we, again, piloted things and we um, asked the kids, um, and our study was going to be specifically for depressed pre-adolescent girls. We asked the girls um, if they'd be comfortable with boys in the group. <coughs> And they said, absolutely not. They'll um, break confidentiality. They'll tell other kids what we have to say. We wouldn't feel safe at all. So same um, gender grouping seems to be really important. There was a, um, some work that Marty Seligman was doing on the prevention of depression. 
and they found different kind of treatment outcome and the, they found that um, the intervention was working for boys but not as well for girls. When they looked at what was going on in the sessions, they found that the boys were dominating the time. So they were getting the, all the therapist's attention and really learning um, the strategies and the girls were sitting back and not um, getting the attention and not really getting it applied to them. So um, that's why it's important to keep, another reason to keep it um, same gender grouping. Uh, we had eight group parent training meetings plus two individual family meetings, right? So the parent training meetings and the individual family meetings were going on um, in a parallel fashion to the um, meetings with the kids themselves. So it's a pretty intense intervention, a lot of effort, a lot of time, pretty you know, expensive in a way to do. Structure of the meetings, one of the defining characteristics of um, CBT is that the sessions are structured. And um, I often find that therapists initially are a little kind of leery of that, you know. Ooh, that's going to feel uncomfortable, it's going to feel unnatural. But you can actually structure the sessions um, and have it be very natural and have a very natural flow to it. And they'll never, they'll never really even catch on to it. So um, you start with a little bit of rapport building. Um, it was kind of funny when we were piloting the intervention, the 12 and 13 year old girls really wanted to take time at the beginning to um, get to know the therapist and know each other. They were not okay with jumping right into um, doing the um, intervention work. They needed that time to reestablish rapport each meeting in order to um, move on with the se session. So they really taught us that um, it's important to do the rapport building each meeting in you know, five to ten minutes. Often what happens in, in, in that time is that um, the kids end up with um, revealing a lot of what's going to become the focus of the intervention. So they are just talking about their week and they end up telling you what went on and what you're going to bring into the meeting. Uh, mood check-in, every week we do a mood check-in. So um, how are you feeling on a zero to 10 scale today? Okay, um, and so that gives you a good idea of what you're going to end up doing. If your group comes in, they're really all flat, then that tells the therapist, okay, what I got to do is an energizing kind of um, coping skill today to get everybody's mood up and get them um, activated. Then after um, the mood check-in, there's a review of homework and a review of the major points from the last meeting. So my question, regardless of whether I'm running in one of these groups or I'm um, working with individuals, always is, so what do you remember from last week? They know it's coming. They know I don't really like to hear. I don't remember anything. <laughs> uh, so after a while, they get um, socialized to start to remember and take note of what were the important things. And um, <coughs> You know, I'm trying to get the kids to do their therapeutic homework. Really difficult to do, but there's, I think, some ways to use technology now to help with that. And we can, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Um, one of the things that's not part of the standard kind of CBT session is what we called goal attainment check-in. So we had the girls at the beginning of treatment set goals for themselves. Every other week we checked in on their progress towards those goals. All right? So, if you're um, mapping progress towards goal attainment and the kids are attaining their goals, what's the therapeutic impact of that? They're going to feel good about themselves. Yeah, you're building self-efficacy. They're going to feel really good about themselves. They're going to feel good about treatment. And um, so you're getting therapeutic benefit out of it by doing it. Um, we collaboratively set the agenda. So the therapists always have on their whiteboard what they want to cover, 
they're going to bring in. So um, what is, what's the message from doing that? They're part of it. Yeah, they're part of it. And that what we're going to do is really dependent upon you that you come in with your agenda. I have one guy that I'm working with right now who I often have the agenda in my head and I launch into my agenda sometimes without, with forgetting to ask him because it's a really fun person to work with and I'm always excited and I, I, between sessions I go, oh, this is what I got to do. That's going to get him better. And so I jump in and then I get about 30 minutes in and he always says, you forgot to ask me what I want to add to the agenda. What I really want to talk about today is this. And um, sometimes, I mean, I'm like, oh, man, I really screwed up because we could have talked the whole meeting about that. It was really important. So um, getting them to add to the agenda is really important. Then you work on the um, skills training, the main part of the session. Some, then, uh, then you summarize the main points. Interpersonal behavior review, that's something that's different about working with kids, too. Okay, so um, you think about your average 9 to 13-year-old. What do they know about being a, a client, a patient? Nothing. They don't know how to take advantage of their experience of being in therapy. You know, adults have some idea. They've watched Bob Newhart or they've watched... They've seen something on TV, on Oprah, or whatever. So they get, or Dr. Phil, or whatever is popular at the time. They have some idea of what goes on in therapy. But kids have no idea whatsoever, and they don't have any idea what they're supposed to do in order to be good clients. <coughs> so what we do is we teach them how to be good clients, right? And so we teach them to. Um, think about what we talked about each week and to apply it while um, they're between meetings. We teach them to add to the agenda. We teach them to um, kind of be introspective and all those kind of things that add to um, being a good, a good client. So um, we teach and reinforce that. And then we assign therapeutic homework, get feedback, um, that's the most threatening kind of part of doing the treatment is, so how did I do today? You know, did it say anything that um, upset you? How was our meeting today? Right? So you get feedback each week. Why is that important with a depressed patient? What's your guess? See well, if it's working for them. See if it's working for them and see if they misinterpret it something that you said because they're taking what you say and it's going through this negative lens so it's getting distorted and sometimes they take away something that's not therapeutic that's actually counter therapeutic so if you check in with them each session um, and they're open you learn whether you've accidentally done that or not it's totally negative. Uh -huh. Do you do, do the session again? Focus on the same thing in a different way, or do you do? Yeah, I would just process that at the moment and help them to understand what I really meant, right. and how, um, and maybe even talk about how it reflects a theme in their way of distorting things. And it, and usually it does, and so you've identified a belief and then that's going to be something that you're going to restructure over time. And then um, uh, we incentivize by having the kids um, able to um, get rewards for attending the sessions. So it's really important to get the kids to come to these um, therapy sessions for the um, treatment outcome study, and so we incentivized. And uh, yeah, man, it, I think the, the kids had fun with it, but that really wasn't why they came. I think they came because they were with that group and they were having fun. So that's the basic structure in every session. Okay, and as I mentioned, 
Um, there's the interpersonal behavior re review, and that starts with the therapist um, describing for the kids what they did well, and then um, it moved from the therapist describing it to um, the girls describing it for each other. So we found these squishy little um, balls, and we were thinking about this idea, this concept of catch the positive. So how do you catch the positive? Well, um, I don't know who's good at catching, but what it, you would do <laughs> is you would say, um, nice catch. Um, you'd say, like, um, great job. You've done a great job of answering questions today. I really appreciate it, and um, you're really tuned in. So then you would throw it to someone else. Go ahead. Okay. So she even jumped ahead, and um, she did it. So, you know, it starts with the therapist modeling by doing it over and over. And then it moves to the kids in the group, model, um, kids in the group doing it for each other. And then um, what it ends up happening is, in order when they toss it, um, they have to say what they did well. So it goes from therapist to other group members to do it for yourself. And it kind of parallels what's going on cognitively in the intervention. The therapist is doing the restructuring. Then the other kids start to help, and eventually it's, um, the kids are internalizing it and doing it for themselves. Okay? So, um, Where'd you get those? Um, let's, Oriental that's it. <laughs> Oriental Trading Company. And there are all sorts of colors, these bright colors. Um, I had tons of them, and that, I only had one left. They seem to disappear at, on, on campus, I don't know out of the office. But, um, you know, they're relatively inexpensive and yet they make a nice, they make the point and the kids really kind of have fun with it. And then we give them to the parents because we want the parents to um, catch the positive of their daughters and so they, they each got um, one of those and they used them. And the kids actually um, became very attached to that process. Okay, how do you get the kids to do therapeutic homework? That's the quest question that everybody always asks. And so we've done a whole bunch of things. We created a workbook. Um, they received rewards for it. We always ask them about it every session. We confront them if they don't do it. Um, we I identify roadblocks to doing it and problem solve. Um, we structure when, where they're going to do it explain the value of doing it, had them put up signs all over their house about remember your homework, had them remind each other to do it. Well, um, we had parents reinforce the kids for doing it. Austin's um, the number one most plugged in city in the country. Therapists started sending emails to the kids to remember to do their therapeutic homework. It helped a ton. Now in practice, I text the kids, and um, they do it. So, um, you know, you can use technology to um, the advantage of getting the kids to do their therapeutic homework. So, um, let's say I'm working with someone who has OCD, and I've got them doing an exposure. Um, and I've given them specific instructions for how they're supposed to do that exposure, well, um, I can keep track of it by having them text me and tell me how it went. Or I can have them email me and give me the list of each of the exposures, how um, long it took for their anxiety to come down and what they did. So, um, you know, technology can be used in a, um, to help get the kids to do their homework. It's a lot of extra work because that means now you're online with um, and checking your therapeutic homework with the kids. Um, it also can be problematic if you've got a kid who's um, suicidal or um, at risk. They might email you related to that. So 
puts you at some risk with that. So you have to be really clear that if they're um, suicidal or if there's any kind of emergency, you're not, um, you don't read your email. It's not like, um, I don't know, what, I, I don't know how Twitter works and all that, but it's not like instantaneous fle feedback and that you're always on and you know what's going on. That you check it maybe once or twice a day so if there's an emergency situation, they have to call you. Okay, so you gotta be really clear in that. And that um, email is not the way to talk about emergency or urgent kind of situations. It's just for um, homework purposes. And the same with texting. Although when you, um, I did an intensive training in DBT, and um, what they talk about um, is that uh, they use texting with the um, borderline patients as a way to really stay in touch with them. And so I do the same thing in practice. And you get some pretty intense text messages. But as soon as the intense ones come in, you call the person. And if you get that text message as a um, kind of a warning, it gives you time to think about what you're going to do, what you're going to say, how you're going to approach it before you make the phone call. OK, what are the primary treatment ingredients? Um, I'm checking. Is it 10 o'clock, or what time is it? OK, so um, we're behind schedule. And I kind of figured we would be, but we're a little further behind than I expected. So. Um, we'll have to try to pick it up a little bit, but if, um, you know, this had been a um, therapy session and we had ended, I would have totally blown it because I didn't follow the structure, <laughs> right? So we're in there doing the skills training and so what should I have done before we um, took a break? Yeah, I should have done some, a summary, done a review with you about what were the main points. And then I would have done the kind of positive behavioral um, review with you. And then we would have done um, homework assignment. So what you were going to do for homework between then and when we reconvened. And then um, mood check-in, so check in and see how we're doing so far. And then um, rewards. Okay, so um, to start the next um, session, what would I do? A little bit of rapport building again, and then um, we do what? Review. We review. Okay, so what do you think um, are the main kind of things that you would take away from um, what we've discussed so far? Okay, fun and engaging. Great. What else? Flexible. Flexible. Good. What else? Let the child have input. Okay, great. What else? Positive reinforcement and feedback. Okay, good. Establish rapport. Okay, so the, the importance of rapport and the therapeutic relationship. What else? What are the three <laughs> main kind of um, treatment strategies? You have those three kind of things. All right. So that is pretty clever. It's kind of like problem. Um, so if you um, if you're feeling bad and um, it's due to an um, unpleasant, un, um, you know, unfortunate situation, and you can change it, you use problem solving. If you're feeling bad and it's an unfortunate situation and you can't change it, you cope. And if it's you're feeling bad and it's due to negative thinking, you change your thinking. Okay, so let's keep work on keeping that in mind. All right, so here are the main treatment ingredients. Um, affective ed, goal setting, coping and, and emotion regulation, skills training, problem solving cognitive restructuring, building positive core beliefs, and then creating a positive family environment and creation of a family environment that supports 
um, the development of adaptive core beliefs. Okay, so those are the main treatment ingredients. Um, here's kind of secondary ones, reinforcement. It's a lot of interpersonal skills training that goes on, self-monitoring and some self-improvement. All right, there's our three main ingredients again. How to use a manual. Um, again, you know, there's this um, emphasis on evidence-based inter practice. And so um, people talked about how do you help to disseminate um, how you do treatment. Well, there was the idea that um, if you created treatment manuals, that um, evens the playing field. And um, what we ended up finding out was it really doesn't. So it gives people an idea of what to do, but it takes a fair amount of training with supervision, ongoing supervision, to really be able to get good at um, doing these evidence-based interventions. Um, remember that the manual is just a guide. You have to use it flexibly. Um, creatively apply the objectives. Um, make it engaging. Use the handouts or create your own. Make it fit for your child and the family. And keep the themes going. And by that I mean um, you want to stick with your objective and keep building on it regardless of what the kids bring in. So you adapt what you're doing to what the kids bring in, but you still keep your um, theme going. Otherwise, the kids bounce you all over the place and you never get anywhere. Because they come in with you know, a new crisis each day, and so if you jump all around, you're not going to get to where you need to get to. So flexible, um, this is just a visual way of thinking of it, that um, even though we typically begin with affective education and in positive fam building a positive family environment. Then we teach coping skills, problem solving, cognitive restructuring, and building a positive sense of self. You just have to um, use whichever of these strategies is going to work with what the kids bring in that day. Okay, So be flexible. All right, guided by a case conceptualization. And um, what's the CBT model of depression, anxiety, conduct disorder? It's a stress diathesis model. Okay, so um, the model that we followed when we were developing our intervention for depression is a stress diathesis model. And um, it kind of looks like this. Um, so you have um, some sort of neurological, possibly biological basis to the disorder. That could be the diathesis for some kids. Likewise, there could be um, a, the diathesis could be in cognition. So from your um, classwork on um, child psychopathology and you think about the primary models of depression, what would be the cognitive diathesis, or what could be the, some of the cognitive diatheses? Think of. Was it the okay, so there we go. From the um, Beck's cognitive therapy perspective, it'd be um, the depressive cognitive triad, the negative view of the self, world, and future. Okay, what about from um, Lynn Abramson's model? What would it be? The learned what? <laughs> there you go. The learned helplessness model, hopelessness model. So it would be um, due to that um, attributional cognitive style. Okay. So Beck actually incorporates that into his model as well. So it's not just the cognitive triad. It's the cognitive triad with that um, uh, ineffective, maladaptive attributional style. Okay. Um, what about behaviorally? What do the behavioral models suggest might lead to depression? Poor, poor, poor um, social skills. Kids don't have good social skills, so they don't um, receive adequate reinforcement. Likewise, um, for 
those of you who are working with kids with cognitive disabilities or other disabilities, it could be that they um, are faced with a world that, where they're not um, as competent as their peers. Academically, some of the kids are not doing well. Um, so you could find other kinds of skills deficits that lead to um, depression. Emotionally, obviously, we're going to have um, dysphoria, irritability, um, anhedonia. And um, there's a, kids are in an environment that's shaping their skills. So a little different than adults is that the kids' skills are still developing. Their way of thinking is still developing. Kids are affected by the emotional tone in the household. If they live in an environment that's very conflictual, irritable, what are they going to feel? Exactly. If they're in a real downer um, kind of situation, they're going to be pretty down. So um, I remember one of the very first kids that I worked with um, that had depression, uh, she couldn't come up with recreational activities, fun things to do. When I would talk with her about what's something fun to do, it'd be homework, um, practice my instrument, things like that. Well, when um, I talked with parents about trying to get her more um, recreationally active, their belief was that's a waste of time. So their family centered around doing mastery activities, nothing fun, nothing social. And that's what she learned. That's what she internalized. Okay, So that's the part we have to remember about kids, is that um, they're in that environment that's still shaping the beliefs that they're holding on to and developing. And then they also have a learning history, and that's going to um, affect the way that they think, the way that they behave, their emotions. And now, you know, more than ever, we understand that the brain is um, malleable, that um, our behavioral interventions affect brain structure and brain functioning. So it's not just that, you know, in the past, the arrow would have been from um, neurobiological things out to the others, but now we know that all of um, our behaviors, our way of thinking, emotions all impact the brain too. So it's, um, there's a reciprocal relationship between each of these areas. And um, so an intervention in any one area can affect the others, just like a um, uh, kind of a problem in one area can affect all the others. So we have to kind of keep that in mind when we're developing our treatment plan. Okay, so from the CBT perspective, um, it's one of the kind of core concepts is the idea that we seek and use information to construct our re own reality. Okay? So the way that um, the kids you work with perceive things is based on their construction of what's going on. It's not based on what's actually going on. It's based on their construction of what's going on. And our emotional reaction is based on that construction rather than what's actually happening. Okay? Now, if I have a construction about what's going on, but there's an error in it, which is what um, often is happening in depression, same with, with anxiety, then um, that error could, could be in the place of what we attend to. So what do the anxious kids attend to? Threat right. Threats in the environment. All right. Um, what do the depressed kids attend to? They attend to things that um, suggest that they're unlovable, worthless, and helpless. They look for those three things. 
the um, error can occur in what we recall. So if your um, emotion is sadness, what are you going to recall? Sadness. At unpleasant negative things. And um, it, the error could be in how we interpret it or the meaning we draw from it, our interpretation. And we um, see that systematic errors um, contribute to psychological disorders. Okay, so um, I want you to really keep in mind that one of the core concepts is the idea that we seek um, and actively make meaning of what goes on around us, okay? Because that's kind of an underlying theme to the um, cognitive restructuring that you all um, hope to learn more about. Core beliefs are formed through early um, learning experiences and communications within the family. So um, core beliefs are the most kind of central beliefs that you hold. And so what would you guess um, are going to be the most central beliefs that a person has? What are they going to be about? What's the content of them? Mm. Okay, so kind of trust in that um, it's going to be one of the areas of, that's going to be a core belief is about relationships and how you fit into relationships. Okay, there we go. It's going to be about the self. Uh huh. How um, your sense of self-efficacy, your sense of how lovable you are, how worthwhile you are. Okay. So, um, and then another area that's part of the cognitive triad is your um, beliefs about the future. Okay. All right. So, um, you, when you're working with kids, those beliefs are still in a developmental stage. Now, when you get up to 12, 13 years old, they're really starting to structuralize. So for your high school kids, they're in place. But, um, you know, they're still, I think, more malleable than um, older adults because there's less time that, that they've, and less data that's been collected. Um, so the core beliefs associated with depression are I'm unlovable, I'm worthless, and helpless. It could be any one of those or any combination of them. And once developed, the beliefs are either active or latent. So um, let's say that you have, um, for those of you in outplace, out treatment centers, you have a lot of kids that have had a traumatic history. Okay? And as a result of that traumatic history, they develop a sense of helplessness and unlovability and maybe worthlessness. But there's been intervention, so um, that traumatic history is no longer, the trauma is no longer occurring. Years could pass by, but then um, I had a, a person that I was working with who um, had a trauma history and then started to do volunteer work and in the volunteer work came across people with a trauma history. So if um, his or her beliefs were latent, you know, they were kind of dormant, working with people with a trauma history did what? It activated them and um, then got the person all stirred up because that act reactivated all those beliefs. And um, the core beliefs produce a distortion um, in events. And so what it does is, and you all who have worked, who are working with kids see this, that um, it causes them to find evidence to support the um, belief and to minimize the evidence um, that's contrary to the belief. So um, for you all who work with anxiety disorders, they um, believe that they're um, vulnerable 
is the core belief is vulnerability. And um, so they are looking for evidence that there's threat out there and that they're vulnerable. And then you can try to build in all sorts of evidence that um, not, they're in a safe spot. They can't see it. They distort it so that they remain in a vulnerable position. And for the depressed kids, they distort it to um, remain, I'm unlovable. All right, so um, if they're in an environment that's still leading to the development of those beliefs, what are you going to do? Change that environment. And remember with the kids that it may be real because that's how it develops. So you don't automatically jump to, oh, that's a distorted way of thinking. First, you have to see if the environment really is um, creating a sense of helplessness or really is threatening. And then you, if it's not, then you go after the distortion. Okay, then um, in Beck's model, there's the core beliefs and then there's intermediate beliefs. And so they're um, beliefs that aren't um, kind of as pervasive as deep. And um, they support the core belief. So if the core belief was, um, I'm helpless, then an intermediate belief that supported it, supports it is, I can't do new things without someone's help. All right, so not as um, broad a belief, but um, it still supports that core belief. And conditional assumptions are another form of uh, intermediate belief, and that's kind of like if-then statements. If I try something new on my own, then I'll fail at it. And automatic thoughts. So when you're thinking about cognitive restructuring, um, usually what people think about is, oh, you're changing thoughts. Well, you do, but what you're really shooting for is changing the core beliefs. And the thoughts just are a representation of those core beliefs. Where do you, how do you find um, the kids' thoughts? Okay, so remember I asked you to keep in mind the idea that um, we actively try to derive meaning from what happens around us. So if you keep that concept in mind, and you have now asked the kid that you're working with, so tell me what went on between um, last week and today. What are they doing? They're giving you a stream of thoughts. Okay? So the ne their negative thinking is really easy to access. Whenever you're asking them for their interpretation or the, what meaning they've derived from something, you're getting at their thoughts. Um, remember that their thoughts are going to reflect the beliefs and um, there could be a distortion to them. And that's what we're going to look for. <laughs>